respective organizations. Um, what do you see for, for our audience here as the most important opportunity and for PHSSR in the next 12 months, given some of these contextual uh, factors that I've mentioned and others that you can bring up? What should we be focusing on as a field? So I think it's going to be a real challenge because research tends to want to think in a long time frame, or at least more than the average policymaker's time frame of six months to a year. Um, and yet we're going, through, we're going through massive changes in our system. And starting in January, we are all, the, they've started already, and in January they will be even greater. And we need to be documenting those changes we need to be monitoring those changes. We need to be doing some kind of rapid cycle evaluation of those changes so that with your help, we who are doing the policy advocacy can go in and do those, mid, it's not mid-course, immediate course corrections so that we do not end up having unintended consequences from this change. So I think that's the biggest challenge, and that's a real challenge given how, relatively speaking, how little is invested in PHSSR and in monitoring the public health side of what's going to be happening on health reform. A lot is going to be monitored on the care delivery side. And so I think part of what we have to be looking at is, you know, some of the tremendous opportunities that are, that derive from the policy changes that are being forced on the health care delivery system to insert, to combine forces with whatever term you want to use, to partner with, that's the term of art these days, to partner with what's happening on the health care side to make sure that when we're talking about population health, we're talking about population health in the sense that this group talks about it, which is truly the health of the population, as opposed to the population health that the health care system tends to talk about, which is, you know, my beneficiaries or the people my clinic is serving or my hospital is serving. So I think though there are tremendous, what's exciting about this time despite sequestration, despite, despite budget cuts, despite Congress perhaps meddling in science, but you know when Congress meddled in science and we liked what they were doing, we actually didn't object that much. <laughs> um, so this is just a matter of what they're doing, not if they are doing. Congress has always meddled in science, has always set priorities for NIH and for others. It's just we're not so happy with some of those priorities that they're setting now, and so now we, we elevate it to this level of principle that Congress shouldn't be intruding on scientific decision making. Um, but but the, the tremendous opportunities that are out there as, you know, as we have new resources, despite the budget cuts, new resources to do transformative things in public health through the Prevention and Public Health Fund. Stay tuned tomorrow to see how much of it is left. Um, the, for true prevention. Um, the new partnerships that are happening within the healthcare system where public health truly can be a partner, can be integrated, and where the definition of who does public health is going to evolve. That there are going to be accountable care organizations that really do understand the mission of public health and take on some of those functions, and we should welcome that. Where there's a real opportunity for, as Paul Kinnerick said this morning, for public health to be more of a chief strategist for a community, and perhaps doing less delivery of services. And then, where again, the Affordable Care Act is pushing the system through things like the National Prevention Strategy and the National Prevention Council, thinking beyond the healthcare setting, beyond health, in terms of addressing social determinants of health. So there's a tremendous opportunity to try new things, but what, and, and we know that some of these things are already happening. The problem, I think, the good news is, we have some wonderful stories about how these changes are already occurring in many communities across the country. What we need to do is elevate them beyond just stories so that we know what, and this is where you come in, where we really understand what made some communities make these changes while others didn't, what it takes to bring these to scale, and what it takes to sustain these changes over time. And so that's where you have an incredible opportunity to develop a really policy relevant agenda. The trick is, and we should come back to that, so how do we find the resources right. to do that? Right. Great. Thank you, Jeff. Paul? 
Yeah, so uh, a week ago, Bobby and I were at a meeting out in Chicago, and Rahm Emanuel got up and spoke about some very exciting things he's doing in Chicago in terms of developing green space, getting, uh, changing the school foods, getting kids, people active in the community. And, and he said it as clearly as I've ever heard a politician say it. He goes, look, I'll be frank. What I'm interested in here is the money, is in the money. The health's also nice, okay? That's the world we live in, and we've got to get that. This is about money now, um, and, and that's really what we have to understand more. So what that means is um, we need to, and I would suggest in research, we need to look at if, if the PSSR community doesn't have the, the um, and you may have the skills within it, reach out to the actuaries, reach out to the health economists and bring them into this field. We need to know for those things what public health is doing, how does it save money? And at the state level, that means money to Medicaid. It also, for employers or county commissioners, it means the money they're paying on their employees' health. Um, and at the same time, show us the health impact, because that's why we're in this business. But that in itself is not good enough for the political system. The other area where we have tremendous challenges um, is with all these cuts going on, and since 2010, we've had already about an 8.5% cut in federal funding with sequestration. You know, maybe we'll see another 5% or so, um, and it, that, that's probably not the end of it. And then, of course, the state and local level has been dramatic cuts since 2008. Um, we are really hard pressed to demonstrate what has been the result of those cuts. So the best we can typically do by surveying health departments is find out, well, we laid off this many people, we shut down that many uh, programs, but so what? Nobody cares about health departments laying off government employees. Nobody cares about government programs being shut down. What we haven't been able to show is what has been the impact on the public of that. So if you cut 317, what happens to kids' immunizations? And how many of those kids can't go to school because they don't, haven't had their vaccines. Um, what about the mumps outbreak in Virginia and, and other outbreaks we're seeing, the pertussis outbreak we had in Washington State? Can, is any of that tied to cuts in programs? Maybe not. Um, family planning cuts, can we show there's been an impact on unintended pregnancies? That's the type of stuff we need to know because as long as the message is, well, you can cut public health and they'll suck it up, then just keep cutting public health. And, and that seems to be the message right now. We can't develop that crisp message to say there are consequences to public's health if you cut public health programs. Um, another challenge we face is this notion that if you have an insurance card, you no longer need public health. Um, and frankly, this thinking is quite pervasive, uh, both in the administration and in parts of Congress, um, where the notion is that, well, you know, what did public health do anyway? So wh why do we need a 317 program if people have an insurance card? Not realizing the role that public health plays in the infrastructure um, of vaccines, and even saying that, I'd probably just put you to sleep. But the, you know, we really need to understand that interface between public health and clinical medicine. Um, I was on the APHA website shortly after the fungal meningitis outbreak uh, from Massachusetts, the, the compounder up there, um, in which public health played a phenomenal role. Um, as, as shortly after the physician from Vanderbilt called Marion Kaner at, at the University of, uh, at the, Tennessee Department of Health, within a week, the case fatality rate went from near 50, 30 day case fatality rate near 50% to zero. Lives were saved. And here I am on the APHA website where somebody writes into the blog, what's this got to do with public health? Public health has nothing to do with this outbreak. So we have got, first of all, people need to know what that role is in health, health acquired infections, a major outbreak of hepatitis C this year in, in New Hampshire. We're having a major outbreak right now due to a dental practice in Oklahoma. There's so much public health is engaged with around healthcare acquired infections. Nobody knows about it, but no one has quantified the savings. What was the value of the human life lost um, due to that fungal meningitis outbreak? And we knew the cases, and we saw the case fatality went to zero. So you could actually probably predict that means those, that number of people were saved, and what's the economic value of that many people alive? Those are the types of things we really have to be, you know, we've got to quantify this, um, and we need to do it now. Otherwise, you know, we're going to have tremendous issues with, um, with they have an insurance card, so what do we need public health for? 
Another area that it's related to that is this notion, well, okay, public health, so you want to give vaccines because you happen to be in Tennessee or West Virginia where you're the only provider around there, then just build fee for service with absolutely no appreciation for the re the, uh, what it costs to transform a system, a non-fee-for-service system, into a fee-for-service system. That's another area of research. Where has it worked? I mean, the state who was most advanced to that, Oregon, uh, in terms of fee-for-service vaccinations, was also the state that got an exemption from the CDC in terms of meeting the 317 deadline, which prohibited health departments from prohibited them from vaccinating kids with insurance. So the most advanced state got the exemption. You know why? They had data. They could show the implication. No one else had the data to show it. So there is so much we need you for. There are a lot of natural experiments going on right now. So we need good enough research, not perfect research. So this, the, for example, this Healthy Babies Initiative, we've had 50 states have, 50 states have signed on to reduce preterm birth um, by 8% by 2014. And we are working uh, with the University of Minnesota, Bill Riley on this. But we've had states put in Medi changes to Medicaid policy where they no longer will pay for a non-medically indicated induction before 37 weeks. We've had states that have done voluntarily. So there's all these different innovations going on there that are having a real, no one's studying them. What's the best way to roll out a major public policy that is saving lots of money and lots of lives? We need you guys here studying this fast. So. Um, th there's another area, and, and then I'll stop for a moment, but another area that's really a great opportunity for us. We're seeing more and more states between the public health agencies and the Medicaid looking at public health programs as potentially funded by Medicaid. So we have states where asthma abatement in the home, where fluoridation um, of water is being paid for with, with a Medicaid waiver. The only way you can do that is to show Medicaid a savings. So I'm back to the, where's the money? We need you folks to help us figure out, to go into Medicaid and say, this is how much money we will save you if you pay for this public health program. So that, I think, is our top priority. Great. Thank you. Um, Bobby, from your perspective? Sure. Well, I'd say yes to all of the above. Um, but I'd make some very specific um, recommendations to you uh, as well. The first is I think that the challenges that are confronting the health care and the public health system are going to be with us for a while. And, and what we know about work in this field is that relationships are extraordinarily important. So what I would recommend first is that you figure out at what level of government you would like to work. At what level of government do you think your own research agenda and the research agenda of the people that you're working with um, are, is, is focused at? For example, is it focused at an organizational level? Is it focused at a community level or a local level? Is it focused at a state level or is it focused at a federal level? And having made that decision or coming to that conclusion for your own work and the work of your colleagues, figure out who it is you need to know that's working at those levels and go and talk to, or at that level, and go and talk to someone who's working or a group of people who are working at that level. I'm assuming that uh, because there are many people working in uh, practice-based research networks now that have connections or are meant to have connections with people in communities that you have them already. But I suspect from my own experience that these may not be as well, these relationships may not be as well developed as they probably could be and that they may be limited to only certain organizations with, within a community. And what I suggest is that you develop relationships with organizations in the community, from my perspective, with local health departments go in if you don't already know your local health officer or your state health official if you're working there, or your senator or your representative at the federal level, or if you have connections in an executive branch uh, somewhere at any of those levels, and simply go in and talk to the folks and ask them what's of interest to them and what they'd like to know about. Because your ability to produce data conclusions, hypotheses, information, advice on an ongoing basis as each of these people needs information um, it is really what they're, they're interested in. They want somebody to call to say, I'm thinking about the following thing. I have the following perspective. My political persuasion is as follows. I'd like data to support that or I'd like data to, 
to, um, uh, to make me more visible um, on an issue. And the only way that you're going to know that, what they're thinking about, is to go and talk with them and develop a relationship with them. And that relationship can be a personal relationship. You can um, write them a postcard or a letter periodically so that the sta a staff person in the office sees what you're interested in and, and what you're doing. Um, but uh, go and see them at, and ask what they need and what would be helpful to them. Um, and then, if you're able, and your own research agenda meets those needs, then get to work uh, on that with colleagues uh, uh, within your academic center, within the community, uh, with your local and state health department uh, colleagues to produce uh, what it is they're interested in. The other thing that I'd suggest is to use clear language. Um, a, a discussion about public health doesn't help to brand, in our case, the governmental public health organizations, the local health departments. Um, where our members uh, in NACHO talk about themselves as public health, but the field of public health uh, and the terms public health mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. So I'd suggest when you're talking about, don't talk about public health, talk about something specific within the domain of public health. If you're doing research on local health departments, talk about research about local health departments. If you're doing research on state health departments, talk about state health departments. If you're talking about community-based organizations that aren't governmental uh, in their operation, then talk about themselves specifically. And if you're talking about a larger public health system, always define, ex and use, define exactly what you mean in the use of those terms. I would um, also suggest that um, we know very little about the workforce that's necessary to produce public health in the future. We know very little about the workforce that will be needed within the governmental public health organizations in the future. Um, we know very little about what it will cost to produce the capabilities that are talked about as essential services or that are talked about as even um, particular categorical programs in areas of, for example, maternal and child health or in environmental health. There's a huge piece of, two huge pieces of work out there um, to both understand and project what the governmental public health system at the local level, from my perspective, uh, will cost in the future, uh, the workforce that will be needed to produce the healthier future that we um, all want, and to think within your own educational environment about um, what it is the, um, the, the schools of health, and that could be medicine or public health, ought to be teaching um, uh, young people who will go to work in the health, public health and healthcare space in the future. So research within your own environment um, of your own academic environment about what works, about what works to produce a, su a successful uh, workforce, um, I think is also Im important to do. Study yourselves uh, to see how successful um, your, your own organizations are at, at producing the, the kinds of people and the kinds of uh, better outcomes that uh, we, we'd like to have, I think we'd all like to have. Great. Well, thank you to all three of you for those initial comments, I, and, and Bobby, especially for talking about how to connect with policymakers, because not, first you've got to have the product. You have got to have the, the results and the findings, but connecting and figuring out what level you're going to work at and how you're going to do that. And one quote I use a lot um, is that your data make you credible. You know, you've got to have good data, good evidence, but your stories make you memorable. So, um, you know, the partnership with local public health and with practitioners and communities really helps you develop those stories that translate that specific and, you know, the nebulous of public health into specific impact and outcomes. Yeah, I actually think we need to go a step further because uh, recently when doing some tech, well, we were at some congressional testimony and many of the disease groups got up there with a mom, right. a child, with a grandma. So if we go in there and have data and then we sit a public health person there, it's not nearly as compelling as, let's sit a mom whose kid was saved from accident and meningitis outbreak, or perhaps a mom who lost her kid in a meningitis outbreak, or a, or a pregnant woman 
who delivered and child succumbed to pertussis. I mean, we need those real human interest stories. And right. there has been such reluctance on the part of public health to engage our consumers in our work. Um, and I think we have to. We're never going to stand up against the disease categories who have their arm around the child who's affected if we don't bring real people in that we affect. Great, great point. Thank you.